put a website up, put $30 on Google ads, and immediately started getting people emailing me. And I had no idea what to do with it. Welcome everyone to the Closing Table Podcast, real accounts from real estate professionals brought to you by Windowsill. I'm your host, Kat Schooler, and today I'm sitting down with Jeff Bauer. Jeff is a multiple business owner. He owns Bauer & Sons, a construction company that specializes in post-frame construction in Indiana and Ohio, and 295 Living, where they sell plants for homes, barn doors, and storage areas. Jeff is also a real estate investor, and today Jeff tells us how he rebranded his whole career at the age of 43 and started in construction with no prior construction experience. He also shares what types of investment properties he has, and his view on being a landlord as a hospitality business. Jeff also shares with us his resilience and his take on how he's been able to stay resilient in the challenging real estate world and just his philosophy on it all. So without further ado, let's chat with Jeff. All right. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah. I'd love to start with the rebrand. So at, at 43, you changed it all. You started in construction with no prior experience. Tell us that story. Uh, yeah, that's a good story. Uh, 20 years, almost to the day, um, I left a vocational ministry career. So I started off at 23, working in churches, and I've done a goodly amount of teaching. I worked a lot with international, uh, a lot of different countries and in international humanitarian work, missionary work and then um, helped to launch several nonprofits. At 43, I had four teenagers. I was exhausted from the pace. I finished my college degrees in my 30s. Um, so I was a full-time college student for about six years, uh, working full-time, having four children. We were a single-income family, and we chose to be that way, a single-income family. and. The rebrand kind of happened. Part of it were certain stressors in my own life. And one of those stressors, honestly, was although I would say I was really wealthy in relationships, I was wealthy in experiences, and I'm really grateful. I don't despise any of those days. Um, serving in the nonprofit world is one of the least paid things out there. And at 43, my kids were all becoming teenagers. And honestly, it got really difficult for me to continue. I was continually filling out applications for scholarships, everything I did. And even to the point, you know, my son at the one of my sons at the time was like 14 or 15. And I literally, we just did not have a hundred dollars to have them join the soccer team. Hmm. And it was just part of the rhythm of my life to go, oh, can I get another scholarship application? And I don't want to despise anybody who's in that space, but it got really grading. It was grading on me as a man. And so I was just trying to think through what's a different solution? What can I do? And I always have had little side hustles here and there. Um, but long story short i had a friend of mine this guy who came up via mexico mexico via california out to the midwest just pursuing the american dream and he got connected with the amish community okay and in the amish community this would be a fascinating i want someone to do a documentary on this this is a there is an underground multi-billion dollar industry for driving amish people around america it's very fascinating the culture. So my friend Mario, he was a driver. And so you see the white vans with all these Amish crews driving around. Well, this guy's making 120, $150,000 a year. Wow. Yeah, that's a wow. And I'm over here with a master's degree making 50, trying to feed my kids. And, you know, I'm like, okay, all right, I can't drive Amish guys. That's weird. You know what I mean? I'm not going to go down to burn like you know, what is he doing? So he actually had multiple, multiple vans that he would run. And so he also was a pastor and we sat down and we were chatting. He, he kind of had a small little Mexican church and, um, he gave me an idea one morning for breakfast while we were sitting there eating breakfast. And he said, 
would you ever consider just selling projects? And he just put this idea in my mind. He said, you know, he said, the Amish community, these men are wonderful builders. He said, but they just socially, they don't connect and communicate with the outside world as well. Right. And he said, he said, You've, you're educated, you can communicate with people. So literally I was on a sabbatical and I, he, we had breakfast that afternoon. I drove home, thought about it. God, what would I call my company? I'd call it, I don't know, Bauer and Sons. Put a website up, put $30 on Google ads and immediately started getting people emailing me. And I had no idea what to do with it. So I literally was getting job leads for people asking me about building something and I would get it and go, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know what a 30 by 40 pole barn is. But it showed me, okay, maybe we can, maybe there's something I can do here. And um, Mario was the link. And again, cutting through all the details, I was waiting for some other opportunities. And what happened is I was on a sabbatical, which turned into a departure. And I was down to a handful of paychecks left. And I knocked on this door professionally, knocked on that door professionally. I was going to try to be, you know, a professor over here or maybe do international sales for, you know, do it best, um, you know, looking for opportunity. And all I had was this one little sliver of hope thinking, OK, well, maybe I can do this thing that Mario gave me this idea for. I was down to two paychecks. And to be honest, I just absolutely melted one night just in my office at home like just weeping, like just fell on the ground, just like literally weeping, just like, I can't believe I did this to my family. I'm running out of money. I, what are you thinking? You don't have anything. What are you going to do? And, um, you know, it, it was so incredibly stressful that, that time. Um, we didn't have a thousand dollars in savings and I had my kids to take care of. So I said, you know, I, I felt like I was in Vegas, you know what I mean? And I was just like, you know, we're, we're going in. That's all I can do. Mm -hmm. And so I started, I developed the website. I was up at 630 in the morning, sitting in the office and figuring out anything I could do. Mario connected me with, with the right guys in the Amish community. They took a liking to me and I sold a roof job. And I put a roof on a guy's house and made $5,000. Now you're talking to a guy that made a thousand dollars a week. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is unbelievable. You can make money in construction. And it, it was, it was the spark. And from there I'm entering my seventh year. We've done a lot of business. We've got an award winning helicopter hangar we've built. We now do wow. commercial, uh, construction in one of the most difficult counties in Indiana. And, um, we've, really been very fortunate to put up a lot of buildings for people so that's an incredible transformation and i think a, a lot of people can identify kind of with those with those lows and i think it's really amazing that it turned into such a huge success and so then you kind of went on to specialize in in barns and mm -hmm. barn dominiums so how did you find that niche well, the barn building world is huge in Midwest. I mean, the, the, the barn is everybody's backyard something, you know, it's rural, um, you know, a lot of rural communities out there. So everybody needs, you know, post frame building. So I kind of refer to post frame structures or pole barns kind of as the low hanging fruit in construction. They're fairly simple. You just have to find the right teams of people who understand how they're built. And, um, that was just the niche that I got connected with because the guys I met in the Amish community, that's what they did. Mm. And they coached me along. And it, it's, so, it's so crazy. I mean, I would wake up in the morning and I would have people email me. I would get on the phone with them. And we, again, I, I really didn't know what I was talking about. So I would get the quotes and people would tell me about the size of the building and the things that they wanted. And I would go, this is great. I'm going to get back in touch with you and all this stuff. Let me, let me take this down to my guys. And I would physically take all this information. I would drive an hour South 
and sit down oh. with this gentleman named Ben Schwartz, this Amish dude, and he would sit there with me up in his attic and he would just, okay. And he'd sketch it all out and map it out and I'd go back and try to close the deal. Um, I'll tell you one of the funniest stories. I was literally, I started this company. I put it all on a credit card when I first started. I was driving a, I was driving a purple Toyota Corolla, a 1997 Toyota Corolla. And I knew that I had to get in front of people Mm -hmm. to connect with them. And so one morning I lined up four different site visits with people. And I remember going, number one, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I got to go meet these people. Number two, I'm driving a purple Corolla. Okay. This is not going to work. So I was at enterprise when they opened at 6 AM, I got to rent something. I was like, okay, how much for the Chevy Silverado? And I remember the guy saying 60 bucks for the day. And I was like, oh my gosh, $60 for the day. Okay, I'll put it on the credit card. And I, I picked up a, a, an Amish gentleman who's a very good builder. And I took him to all four of those job sites, met those clients, walked in. Hey, how you guys doing? I'm Jeff. I brought this gentleman with me. He's going to answer all your questions. And we built three of those buildings. Wow. From that one day of interaction and that. So I was like, this is good. These guys are helping me. They're connecting with me and we're delivering a product that people love. And that's it. And that continues to be your system today. No, oh, we're okay. much more complex. Uh, yeah, today. Yeah, we're much more complex. We do in-house quoting. We've got software. We're, you know, fully licensed um for our county which is which is it's a very extreme kind of process mm. um and now that we've moved into commercial structures now i mean i could tell you anything you want to know about a pole barn at this point it's <laughs> yeah. been six years yeah but do, uh, do you still work with the amish or no i you, do oh okay yeah so the main guys that build all of our structures really it's a it's one key amish team and it's a great symbiotic relationship we love them we take good care of them and that's what they do what they do best mm -hmm. and they get there and they deliver a wonderful product. They know a lot more than me about the methods of construction and how, you know, how those systems actually work. And I know how, you know, computers and tech and all right. that stuff, you know, how it is. It's so funny because when you were, you know, when you were first saying like, oh, you got all these leads coming in and, and you got to ask this guy questions. I'm thinking like, okay, well, he hops on the phone. No, you have to drive. Like we're so conditioned to our modern world that someone who's um not in you know not using technology you have to go to them absolutely um, absolutely so this construction endeavor sparked kind of a whole real estate journey for you yes because then you turned into being a real estate investor and mm -hmm. and a landlord and things like that yeah so i any anybody with some kind of common sense about how money works realizes that for those of us that don't have deep savings or have had more of a traditional career real estate is probably about the easiest way for what i would say regular people uh to become long term to create wealth mm -hmm. to, to at least build some type of retirement or wealth so that's pretty simple, but a lot of us think about that only in the context of our personal home that we live in. But I got into real estate. I had a uh, had a business partner, and there was some uh, there was some real estate that we got into and decided to operate that as an Airbnb. And I do remember it was very like nervous at first, you know, like anything you do for the first time. You're going, oh man, is this really going to work, or what's it going to be like? Um, but construction and home renovation or flipping a house or anything, obviously it fits hand in glove because I've got these work crews. We've got access to material. You start to understand how the supply chain works, who, you know, who's got the best prices and you're kind of doing wholesale construction mm -hmm. work. So I was like, well, so I formulated, um, a little real estate LLC and, and basically got into renovating homes and then, uh, through about three years into that, uh, that relationship severed and I had to start completely over. Um, so three years ago, I started again and had to rebuild my real estate portfolio from scratch. 
Yeah. So what do you have going on now? So right now, um, again, uh, I, I'm, you know, I, I, there's a lot of people who come on the podcasts and they are, they have, you know, they've hit that golden stride of life and we all look up to them like they're gurus. I come from a long line of scrappy, just, you got to get it done. You know what I mean? You start <laughs> at the bottom and you, you got to work for it. Um, so for me, I was looking for a piece of real estate that I could house my construction company. And I had a wonderful opportunity to buy a two and a half acre parcel that had a, a, a home on it, plus an outbuilding. And the outbuilding had already been converted with a couple of bathrooms and an office. Okay. And so I looked at that and I was like, well, hold on here. If I can put my office here, then I can rent the home. And now, so I can have everything, everything for free. So what I have going on is I run a four bedroom home that I rent per bedroom. And it's almost like a youth hostel, but I rent it per bedroom. Um, I've got a, not a rental arbitrage sense, but I, I property manage for a friend of mine. And then I've picked up, uh, renovated a duplex. I've got another home and then I just bought a home. And I've, so I've got five properties that I own and one extra that I manage. Very cool. And so this rental that you do by room is, is really interesting. I've heard you talk about it before. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that'll be really eye opening for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um, so can you tell us the story of, of like how you got onto this idea and like, it's been really successful for you. So I'm, I think people are going to want to really key into this. Yeah. So what kind of helps it is you, uh, the location happens to be a mile away from our largest hospital mm -hmm. okay, in Fort Wayne. Now, what scared me about it was I couldn't grasp the idea, but I had a friend of mine during the pandemic who was a travel nurse. And he told me that he, now he had gone to multiple states and he explained to me that he was staying in these homes and he was just renting a bedroom and the other bedrooms were filled with other guests, other nurses. And I'm like, hold on. I'm like, no, 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 no. To like, I need to, I need to get this you know, And I've stayed in a couple of hostels in other countries, but, um, but I, I was pretty nervous about this, but I said, I'm just going to go for it. So when I bought the property, I renoed the whole thing. Facebook marketplace, got all the furniture, mapped it out, did all the artwork and stuff like that. that. That's part of my creative outlet that I enjoy. And I just listed it on Furnished Finder. So Furnished Finder, if your audience doesn't know, it's a wonderful platform that connects specifically more travel nurses or traveling medical professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of other people who use that platform, but I have found Furnished Finder is good. Even Roomies. I've pitched, you know, found a couple of people through the Roomies website. Um, and I moved away from Airbnb just because it's a different clientele. And I found them to be a little persnickety and you're chasing reviews. Mm. So the travel nurses are really chill and they're easy. And I keep it as simple as possible. Um, so basically I just rent, you get a bedroom, you share the kitchen, you share the bathroom with one person. Everybody has an individual lock. So you get your own key to your bedroom. Everybody has a television. Everybody gets a smart TV and a full-size bed. That's it. No drama. You know, if you're drama, you're out. Pay me at the beginning of the month. That's as easy as it, as it is. I don't do deposits. I do a one page, fill this out. Give me a picture of your driver's license. And you're in the house. And it's been booked for three years, you said, right? I've had all four bedrooms. I've been about a 90% occupancy. And people are going to ask, what is he renting the bedrooms for? I can tell you that I'm a solid three-star accommodation. <laughs> it is the old farmhouse. That's what I tell people. This is not a hotel. But it's $26 a night. So people pay me $800 per bedroom. So I turn $3,200 a month on average for this old farmhouse. And that's it. And that probably more than pays for the mortgage. Yeah, it, it's Indiana. I was just talking to a different real estate agent. We were talking about how affordable real estate in Indiana is. It's, it, you know what? As a matter of fact, Fort Wayne, Indiana, 
just in the past two weeks has been noted on a realtor.com article. It was the number one out of 20 cities, mid-sized cities. We have won numerous awards over the past decade for our baseball stadium, um, affordable housing. We have a lot of great industry. And there was an article actually even in the Daily Mail in the UK oh. specifically talking about Fort Wayne, Indiana as a Midwest city that people should look at. So it's a good time. Not that we want, we don't, you know, we don't really want outside investors. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no offense to anybody, especially California money. You guys can, you know, stay out West. <laughs> but um, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great place. It's like just really great family values. Um, a lot of people. So I've lived in five other states. Mm -hmm. And so when you I've seen all these other places from West to East Coast and, you know, you have to take the good and you take the bad of every place. Mm -hmm. And so I look at Fort Wayne and I'm like, you know, it's 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 got its things and uh, it's easy to leave, easy to travel out of. But and it's good. It's a good place. Yeah. Yeah. My grandma lives in Indiana, so I've been in and out of Indiana okay. my whole life. So, right. yeah, I know the vibe. Yeah, super. Yeah. So. Being a landlord for you, there's a little more to it. It's it's about hospitality, and you kind of view it as a hospitality business. Can you speak to that? Um, yes, I can because I I look at any business as I am searching for the right clientele. I'm looking for people that I work well with that I would like to work with, mm -hmm. and when I treat my real estate as a hospitality business, I I feel like I'm offering more care to my people. And again, I'm translating this out of my 20 year career of, you know, when you're cut, when you're, when you're in the nonprofit Christian oriented ministry field, I mean, look at the values of that. It's honesty, um, high integrity. It's about serving people. It's about putting other people first. It's about, you know, deferring, and there's a lot of like really strong character qualities, even if a person was non-religious, you know, regardless of their spiritual orientation, those are great values to bring into business. And so I have found that to be helpful. So I look at all my people like, I just wanna be friends with them. As a matter of fact, uh, I was just hanging out with my favorite tenant um, last night. We were smoking a cigar together, um, Yolanda, has been renting from me for quite some time and we hang out we'll smoke cigars together every once in a while you know if i'm down there i'm like hey what are you guys you know what are you doing i'll sit on the front porch and um so i think we see a lot of people who look at real estate as just i'm here to invest in this and you're paying my mortgage not that everybody does that of course but it can be a very taking kind of um disposition instead of a serving disposition. Um, I, I I love the, the, he's in heaven now, but Zig Ziglar, mm -hmm. probably the greatest motivational guy that's ever been around. And Zig, he said repeatedly, you can have anything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. And so, I do understand real estate. We're all watching this or wanting to learn how to do real estate because we understand the concept. We get a guest who comes in, they're paying our mortgage for us and it's a, and it's a, a benefit. I want my people to stay forever. I want them to love the, the sense. So all of my property I run, I do only furnished fully paid for all inclusive rent. So I have people come in, I am paying 100% of the bills in the home. And because I'm paying 100% of the bills and it's my furniture that you're on, I'm also there cutting the grass. I'm the one managing everything on those properties. So I'm, I'm in it. I see it. My eyes are on it. You can't be a slumlord like that. Um, so I interact with my clients and you also get a higher standard. You get a higher caliber of guest because you are going to be charging a little bit of a premium for those services, but I'm helping people who come into town and say, you know, I got a gentleman right now. He's got a three month gig as a, um, you know, as a whatever project management guy. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, come on in, 
Here it is. You pay in the beginning of the month. You know, he's got he's in a beautiful duplex that I own. And um, but, you know, he's there for three months. And I mean, we all understand how this concept works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you get a you get a higher caliber clientele. So that's what I mean by hospitality. I want them to I want them to go, man, I, I love this. You know, I, I love being here. Well, and I think it's a really interesting lens because I think a lot of people when they're getting into rentals or maybe they're like looking at it maybe from more of a numbers standpoint, especially mm -hmm. if they're owning property in a different state. I've talked to people who who do that. Um and and even if they, they themselves manage it or if a property management company manages it, you're just so distanced from it, right? That you're not kind of having the relationship element of it. And I don't know. I I don't really know where I'm going with that, but. No, no yeah. I'll actually, I, yeah. I, will, I will speak to that. And, you know, right now there's a huge thing in the real estate. Just, we, just be honest with it. I mean, just scroll through YouTube and Instagram. Mm -hmm. There's all, there's, we, we live in a time that is becoming so divisive and everything is being nuanced and divided. And you can see this almost in like a class war of people. So there's a lot of anti landlord sentiment out there. I hear it all the time, you know, landlords are parasites, things like that. I see these comments I'm like, you know, that's not necessarily true, but I, the people they're referencing, they, I, I share this, I share the same animosity towards the, the investors that come from other states. They have deep, deep pockets and they come into Midwest towns or other cities and they swoop up and they own 30, 40, 50, 80 homes. And they do exactly what you're saying. And I've written letters to these people personally written them letters. And I said, I want you to consider if I bought a home in your neighborhood where you live, and then I didn't maintain it. If I don't maintain a home in your neighborhood, you drive my property value. I would drive you down. Mm -hmm. And it really goes back to, you know, it, what is loving, you know, what, what is loving and caring. And so it, it's, it's loving to think of your own home and to care for your home and your own city first. So I do think in the bigger picture, there should be a lot more guidance. I hate the word regulation, but there needs to be a little more help so that local people can get into owning homes, mm -hmm. you know, locally, um, because there, there, there is an issue, but all that to say, if we just, if we care about people, if we're, if we, if people just genuinely care about the people they're, they're servicing and taking care of. And, you know, again, I don't want to sound cheesy. This is going to sound, it's not cheesy. It's a, it's, it's a phrase I have, you know, I write on the whiteboard all the time. Um, but really if everybody tended their own garden, then the world would be at peace. And, as I expand my little portfolio of homes, that makes my garden a little larger and it's my responsibility to tend that garden. Mm -hmm. And that's my philosophy. And I'd love to see other investors say, if I bought this home, if I'm out of state and I'm in Fort Wayne or I bought a home wherever they do, if they just said, I'm going to take care of it. Like I would want to live in it myself. Right. So that's my heart. Yeah. I, you know, and I do think there are a lot of people who don't understand the kind of commitment it is to to be a landlord or to manage a property. I mm -hmm. think they're just looking at the numbers like, oh, I, you know, I pay this much for it. I you know, jazz it up a little. Then I can rent it mm. for this much and, and make all this money. And like my grandmother owned several rentals for a while and even into her like 80s. Now she's in her 90s now. I think she was still owning these properties and it was like, Mama, you got to sell it. You can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Like you... <laughs> Like you're you're not doing a good job. They're not paying you. Like we gotta get out. It's time. Yeah, yeah. You made your money. Yeah. Cash out. Yeah. Yeah, cash out. I bumped into a guy. Um, I bumped into a guy in Fort Wayne. He um was swapping twenty Airbnbs for traditional long term rent, and he was selling off all this stuff. And I and I looked at him. He was about 
60 years old and um you know similar to the story you're saying about your grandmother and i met him at his driveway buying some stuff you know out of his old airbnbs and uh i was like so when did you get started oh 30 years ago I said how many properties you got 40. wow i said where's your homes what kind of neighborhood are you in oh i'm in west central i got a few over here i got a few over there and i looked at the guy and said you've got over 10 million dollars in real estate don't you and he just smiled at me and i thought there is a point when you go i just don't need it i was like dude why don't you just sell it all and just go do whatever you want to do right <laughs> that's the retirement right there yeah because if you own it it will own you mm. if you own it if you strive to obtain it you will strive to maintain it and you that's the burden that some people don't want to want to bear is the maintenance of 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 owning all these properties so you've done airbnb as well mm -hmm. and you've done vrbo or verbo i've heard also people call it yeah um what made you decide to no longer work on those platforms because you're exclusively on furnished finder now well in roomies you said as well yeah furnished finder roomies and facebook facebook yeah. marketplace just like that i can get if i list a property you can get a dozen inquiries in about 48 hours and they're they're good we all have to weed through searching for the right client okay yeah yeah we're looking for people that fit who you know who we want to vibe with that's that's really what it is but the style of rent is different than just the traditional fill out the app give me a credit check all this kind of stuff i don't do that kind of stuff so, so i'm I'm curious why Air, why you left Airbnb in the yeah. end. Um, straight up. Yeah. I think their support is horrible. I think it's horrible. I've been, I've traveled to dozens of Airbnbs. I've been really fortunate to see a lot of the world and um, both sides as, as a host and as a guest. I have been disenfranchised with that model. Doesn't mean it doesn't work. Doesn't mean that people can't enjoy it. I'm staying at an Airbnb next month. But I I got disenfranchised. A lot of it too was your chase, constantly chasing at the whims of, it, it's a fickle audience. So the, those clientele, people would come in and you know they'd leave you a four-star review. There was a bug in the trash can. You know, like, oh, the, I, I didn't like the mattress. And you're like, it's like Goldilocks. You know, like, I, you, you know what I mean? A mattress is a little subjective. Oh, it's very. Speaking of different clientele, yeah. you know, how did you go about, right? How did you go about finding the right clientele? And, and how do you suggest other people kind of zero in on their clientele? Most places, when you're, when, when you're running a smaller portfolio, it's more personal. And I suggest that people keep it personal. So the way I keep it personal is I minimize paperwork. So I don't do a lot of, you know, I don't have a wall of, of just frivolous paperwork. As soon as you're interested in one of my properties, here's my number, call me. We're gonna call, we're gonna meet if we need to meet, or we're gonna talk on the phone. How you doing, Kat, where are you from? Oh, where'd you grow up? Where are you working? Tell me about your story. Who are you? Why are you coming into town? And so I'm going to try and get the best bead on you as a human. And that's how I find my clients is to really find out who they are and really what their long-term plan is. And some of it's just as simple as I'm a nurse and I'm in town and this is what I'm doing. I've got a married couple actually that's going to stay in the house next week. I check in with my other three guests. Hey guys, do you mind if a married couple lives in this bedroom? Right. That sort of thing. Um, but you know, you just try to get to know them a little bit, um, especially for someone who's going to stay a little bit longer and it's not always perfect. You know, I've been skipped out on, I had a young lady that owed me 1300 bucks and mm. saw on the camera. She just packed up and I was like, I think she's leaving. <laughs> yeah. Do you just, I mean, do you just like count that as a loss or? You know what? I had a $500 deposit that she'd given me. This was in a duplex and to be honest with you, she was 26 years old or 24 years old, um, around the same age as my daughter. And when she moved in, I chatted with her, you know, I got to know her, got her whole story. She was moving to the city for the first time. 
And I said, I get it. I said, hey, I've got a daughter. If you need some help with something, you know, and I let her know you're in a safe neighborhood, all this kind of stuff. All that to tell you, she needed the, the, the $1,300 rent was a lot more important to her than it was to me at this stage. I'm a 50 year old man. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I don't like to be burnt, but it meant more to her than yeah. it, than it did to me at the time. So I'll, I'll take the loss and just wished her well and said, you know, kind of good luck, you know, good luck in life. I mean, this, it's not a fitting character trait for successful people, but I think we've all been in tough situations. So that, that's how I handled that one. Yeah. I mean, we all make mistakes when we're young. So hopefully that was uh, we just... make mistakes when we're old too. <laughs> yeah. We all make mistakes, period. <laughs> yep. Hopefully that was just um, yeah. one for her. You've uh we were talking before about the four different customers. Uh -huh. Can we can we dive into that? Yeah. So I watched this YouTube video when I first started my company and it's stuck with me ever since. I've kind of taken this guy's idea, developed it more, but ultimately if you are a real estate agent, you know exactly what I'm talking about with four different types of clients, car salesmen, really anybody who sells about anything. So being a contractor, you interact with all these people and the four clients, the four customers really are the cheap client, the problematic, the affluent and the sophisticated and they are very different from each other. So we all generally know what a cheap client is. Cheap clients, it is not about their money. I've worked with very wealthy people who are cheap clients. Matter of fact, I spoke to one today and they drive me crazy because I'm like, don't tell me how much you have back here, but you know, you want more than you're willing to pay for. And you know you have the money. It's a spirit mm -hmm. about people. Um, and that's okay because there's people who can work with that. All right. Problematic clients are people who they just, it, there's just an issue. Something's going to be an issue with them. They have a hard time getting their financing or they're just kind of discombobulated. Um, but the other two, the sophisticated and the affluent clients, those are the two just who I am personally that I get to work with more. And that has partly to do just background, but, Affluent clients, they they tend to know what they want, but they're looking for a little more of a, an emotional connection, all right? It's a little bit more about the feeling. So it's, it's a young lady who's always wanted a Jeep because she had a really cool experience when she was a teenager in a Jeep. And now she's got a job and she can finally make that payment. And so she's not interested, she's not sophisticated in the details of what the mechanics are in the Jeep or what model of Jeep has a better transmission. She, it's a feeling. Um, and then obviously the sophisticated client, I've had people I, I meet with engineers. They are, there's a joke in the contracting field. If you're an engineer, oh my goodness, we're charging you more money. I tell them this, you know, as a joke, because they, they want to know, you know, what's the, what's the, what size nail are you going to put through the board and what's the sheer strength of the nail? And you're like, bro, the barn's going to be fine. Like we're going to put screws and nails in it. Um, but those four clients, if you can kind of identify, you can help to identify who they are. It helps you to learn how to deal with them individually. Um, and then if you have like an affluent client, uh, again, it's not necessarily about money because you could do a $5,000 project or $500,000 project. It's about matching some of their energy and sharing with them their enthusiasm. You know, that's a great choice. I love that you picked those double hung windows. It's going to make your building look way better. Um, that's what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not trying to manipulate people. Right. You know, just trying to be encouraging to them. But and then sophisticated clients, you, you have to you're going to do the work. But that they, they want they want the product. They want to know that you know. Um, so you get all kinds of measure of questions from and and real estate agents know this too. You yeah. Know, they want to know. They've done all the research. This is the school district. This is how far it is to work. This is. They've nuanced every little piece out. They've looked at every part of the home. They're probably way more um, interested in the inspection report, and making sure the inspection report is followed through. 
But once you kind of see that, you, you learn how to deal with them. Yeah, it's just it's knowing people's style. I totally get it. My husband's family, they're all engineers. They're all very exact. <laughs> I love them. They're so fun. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, you, you can know too much sometimes, I think, you know, in the sense that then it might interfere with someone's ability to service you. So tomorrow I am on my way after this trip in Michigan. I'm headed over to Ohio. I'm going to meet a client. I built him a barn a few years ago mm-hmm. during the pandemic, at the beginning of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So if anybody was in construction at that, time, at that time, you'll know that the price of materials was rapidly increasing. Yes. It was just every week and it was out of control. So this guy was an engineer, very, very nice gentleman, but he was an engineer and we had that building price that, hey, Here's the deal. That building's $36,000. I need you to get me a deposit now. Well, what about um, uh, wh- what about the posts? What kind of posts are you going to use? Is it starts, well, it's right here in the, in the thing, dude. These are the posts. Okay. Well, what about this? Okay. Well, let me, let me get this info to you. He literally did that. He what about it to the point that I said, I'm sorry to tell you this, brother. Your $36,000 barn is $42,000. That one month that you waited with your engineering questions because you couldn't settle it um, literally cost him $6,000 on that building. I thought you were going to say more because I know where (laughs) lumber went. But, oh oh gosh, that's so real. Oh, it was so bad. I built a house during the pandemic. Uh, for a lady and it's really one of the funniest stories because it was a grandma never built a home before in her life sweet sweet little lady and um worse what not one of the worst projects i did it's a beautiful beautiful home i've got you can take a look at the home on my youtube channel and um by the time that job was done i'd worked with her for over a year on and off crew guys up back this and that you know what i mean it takes a long time piecemeal and a job together the price of material went up so much when we finished that building i made six hundred dollars oh gosh six hundred and i will say this this is why you need to know who you're working with to be a reputable to work with reputable people and i'm not patting myself on the back i'm just saying that it, it you have to work with reputable builders so i made six hundred dollars on that building Last month, she contacted me and she was one month before legally her workmanship warranty expires in the state of Indiana. Now, I would have taken care of her regardless. She contacted me two years later. Hey, we're having a breathe a breathing issue in the house. Basically, the ridge cap that was put on the way it was designed from the architect. We needed to open up the ridge cap wider. Well, she had to pull out some drywall. Bottom line, I had to send my crew guys back. I had to pay the drywaller. Had to put new insulation here and there. Spent a couple thousand dollars to fix that home. Even after that, and that's. But what I've learned, what I've learned is, you. You know, you gotta you you gotta work with people, and people need to make enough money that they can stay in business. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it's unfortunate that, that happened, but I was at least grateful that we could be people of integrity to say, I don't want to spend this money out of my pocket, you know, out of, out of the company funds, but it, it's the right thing to do. And so to honor her, um, even though I was like, please don't ever call me again. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely little home. Don't call me, please. <laughs> anyway. Talking about working with the right people. Mm -hmm. what do you recommend what kind of people do you recommend someone find on their team if they're getting into kind of real estate investing Mm -hmm. maybe you know kind of doing some uh fix and flips and things like that yeah i can yeah speaking to that so anybody I, i i would hope this would be super helpful for anybody who listens to your podcast um this is not necessarily information for a seasoned real for a seasoned real estate agent. This is for people who go, I, I I'm just scratching the surface, and what do I do? Um, but you have to assemble a team, and that team is going to be comprised of 
the right people that give you the information that you don't know. And you ultimately, any field we get into, we don't know what we don't know. And so we have to ask other people and get coached along. But if, if somebody out here wants to get their first home and there are so many houses available, there are homes all over the country that you can buy for $100,000. Mm -hmm. There really are homes you can buy in multiple states that are $100,000. You're not gonna like them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they might not be the house that you wanna live in, but they're wonderful at long-term investment properties. So your team is gonna be your banker and you have to learn the strategy of presenting yourself. You have to look good on paper and you have to meet a banker and find the right banker. And I suggest small local banks, don't go to Chase and these people go to small local banks because it's about relationship. Um, you're gonna get trusted contractors that are gonna be part of your team, maybe an electrician and either someone who you know is gonna be super honest or maybe like a one man or one woman with a van kind of person. Those are great people to work with on a individual investment property. But I, no offense to realtors at all, but a lot of people, you can buy homes all day long without realtors. And, you know, realtors are great to help, to help the normal person get connected to a piece of real estate. Um, obviously I've done transactions with realtors, but if you're trying to invest, you're trying to cut out some of the middlemen to, to, you know, cause it, it is about the bottom. The more you pay for that home, the more you're going to have to get in rent. Right. Which is cyclical. I know a lot of agents. I actually, I've talked to agents who got in one in particular, she got into real estate. So, uh, as an agent to buy her own home. Yeah. You know, and, and so I do think a lot of agents start on the investment side of things and then maybe they, they expand or they're an agent and then they're expanding into the investment side of things. So it's it's very, you know, full circle for that yeah. industry. Yeah. And and part of that team and by the way, you know, I would say part of that team is obviously you do need not just an agent, you need multiple agents people that know what you're looking for. And so you got to go out and do meet and greets and find, find people and just let them know, Hey, I'm shopping in this kind of this part of town. I'm willing to invest in this part of town and this is my budget, you know? Um, but basically contractor, banker, agent, people who kind of understand your vision and then anybody else behind the scenes that you want to, I do suggest, um, finding a good bookkeeper. Um, I've never done my own books. But ultimately, sub out, just sub out what you're not good at. Do the thing that you're good at, period. Do not try and do all of it. If you try to do all of it, you're gonna, you're gonna toast yourself mm -hmm. and you're not, and you're gonna do a poor job at some of it. I'd be a complete disaster if I had to always pay my own bills and do stuff like that and take care of all the finances. I just, I'm too scatterbrained for that, but that's how you assemble that team. You look at what you're good and bad at or, or where you need some strength and you bring somebody in to help you. And uh, sometimes you gotta pay them. Sometimes it's a, sometimes it's a six pack. Sometimes yeah. it's just pizza, you know, sometimes it's just cash money, um, you know, that you gotta take care of people. Yeah. yeah. Jeff, you're incredibly self-aware, which I think is kind of a rare trait. And the other thing that I've noticed throughout your story is that you're incredibly resilient. Hmm. And and I'd love to get your thoughts on, on how you've been able to stay so resilient through the career changes, through the ups and downs, through uh, having a business partner that you had to part ways with and kind of even reinventing yourself again in, in the real estate construction investing world. Part of it is nature. It is, it is nature. I'm a firm believer that we do get an innate disposition and some, we, we can't necessarily alter all of that innateness of who we are. And so there's some aspects I don't, I can't take credit for. I just have to say that part of the story of maybe moving around a lot, um, has helped me, but my personal take is I, I look at 
life is a giant smorgasbord and I enjoy meeting people, seeing places. And so the resiliency is probably motivated through the desire to create more opportunities. So the, the fact is either we will run our life or somebody else and circumstances will run our life. We, we are in your audience, the, the audience of these types of podcasts, they are resilient people. They are, we could reduce it to victors. That's the mentality of people, you know, real estate agents, they're pretty much their own business owner mm -hmm. a lot of times. So, uh, the, the other big factor in resiliency is I, I am a man who's lost everything. I have legitimately lost everything in 2009. My estimated, uh, my estimated income on my taxes in 2009, single, single income father, four children, and a wife, $6,000. My home in Montana, gone. Mm -hmm. Lived in a ski town, opened up the sliding glass door, looked at Big Mountain. House was foreclosed, sold at the sheriff's sale. Lost my job. I have been, I have been asked to resign three times as a professional in, in this field. That's another reason why I changed. And the resiliency is that nobody is going, nobody is going to build up my retirement. Nobody's going to do this for me. Nobody is going to buy my plane ticket to where I want to go in January. Cause I want to get out of the snow in Indiana. I have to do that. And so that is really the motivation to say that that's, that's, that's what I desire. You know, life is beautiful. There's opportunity everywhere. There's the coolest people in the world everywhere you go, you know, whether it's, I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, from Europe to, I mean, last year I went to Spain, Morocco, this year I'm trying to get down to Argentina. And I just, I want to be with those. I just want to meet people and see them. And so the resiliency for me is, I guess I just want to, I want to enjoy life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's it. And honestly, um, you know, my spiritual life is very deep and residing in me. I, I, I had some very serious encounters with my creator and he's been very gracious and kind to me and has given me that helped me with the internal fortitude that's helped me also therapy, Yeah. <laughs> go to therapy, <laughs> go to therapy. Yeah. It's good for you. I love it. Yeah. Jeff, do you have any parting thoughts? I would encourage anybody to honestly just embrace life and be the architect of your own destiny. It, it's out there. Um, if you want it, you really can go for it. And it, it's, it's so, it seems so trite or so um, cliche to say some of these things, but, but people say them because they're real. That's why we all sound the same. We're all saying when you fail, you have to get back up. You have to get back up. You have to keep going and adjust and learn from it. Own the mistakes. You own the mistakes. That will bring you peace mm -hmm. when you take on the ownership of mistakes that you've made and you just keep moving forward and uh, you, you, you get to write your own script. If not, you know, somebody else is going to do it. So anyway. Kat, I appreciate the time. It's been good hanging out with you. Yes, thank you so much for making your way out here today. Yeah, yeah, super. Thank you for listening to The Closing Table brought to you by Windowsill. I'm Kat Schooler. Please be sure you're following our podcast on Apple or Spotify. And if you're part of our YouTube audience, hit that subscribe button. If you're enjoying this podcast, please feel free to leave us a comment or review. It helps us find more amazing listeners like you. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.